tired doctors and other heroes, I have returned in this country's hour of need, broadcasting live from my own home with a lockdown special. And you can find an exclusive extra episode by searching for Down the Line on BBC Sounds. Hello, I'm Angela Barnes and you're listening to the Friday Night Comedy Podcast. There have been a few changes around here since last week as I continue to do my best to adapt to life in this new normal. Um, For example, I've now adopted a five-level alert system to help my partner understand how hungry I am. I'm currently at level four, which is high risk of hanger, keep two metres away from me. And if I don't eat something soon, I may even tip over into level five, which is risk of becoming overwhelmed and triggers lockdown with several garlic breads. Actually, don't worry. I've just found an old Oreo down the side of the sofa, which should just about take me back to level three, general peckishness. So while I crack on with this stale biscuity disc, here's this week's episode of the News Quiz. Enjoy. Welcome to the News Quiz with your host, Angela Barnes. Hello and welcome to another lockdown edition of the News Quiz. I tell you what, I'm so glad this is an audio medium because I don't think I could bear being judged week after week on my decor and bookcase especially because I'm really into Cold War history, espionage stories and the archers, so I'd definitely end up on a list. Before we get going, let's get started with this warning label read by Neil Sleet. Snooze pod, three-in-one, bedside crib. Warning, keep away from babies and children. Thank you to Alexander Stockler for sending that in. Now let's meet the teams. In Team A, we have Daniel Finkelstein and Jessica Fosterq. Hello. Hi. In Team B, it's Helen Lewis and Darren Harriet. Hello. Hey. How are you all getting on? I'm all right. Good, thanks. It's nice yeah. recording radio, not wearing trousers. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've been feeling the emotions this week. I'm get, I cried because my friend made a crochet doll of me. Ah. Um, that's oh, where I'm at. How's everyone else doing? I think that was voodoo. <laughs> I've been so yeah. scared. <laughs> oh, do you know, I've had these stabbing pains in my kidneys. <laughs> Jess, how are you getting on? I know you're, you're locked down with a four-year-old. How's that? Up and down. I think, on the whole, I'm one of those really annoying people that's achieving loads. Mainly the growth of extraordinary amounts of body hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've, never, I've never really freeing, gone for it? it before. And it is freeing. The other week, I was able mm. to genuinely, effectively use my own shin as a towel. <laughs> Danny, how are you getting on? It's been pretty much uh, okay so far, but I, I'm going a bit crazy now. I know I did an entire charity event and realised I had a half-empty bottle of gin over my right-hand shoulder, um, <laughs> and I'm always a bit nervous that I'm going to be demonstrating uh, books that people will disapprove of on Twitter, but apart from that, I'm fine. <laughs> well, as long as you move Mein Kampf out of the way, I think you're all right. <laughs> my my grandfather had an entire library of books about Nazis. I don't think he would uh, it would have gone down very well if he'd uh, filmed any of it. <laughs> Isn't that because he hunted Nazis? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you should probably get that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> Helen, nice to see you back with us again. Yeah, um, instead of my bookcases, I'm giving you a bit of an insight into my dirty laundry. Just thought that'd be nice for everybody to really check in on the fact that I haven't done as much washing as I could. The cross stitch is coming well, which is an, an improvement. Well, it's lovely to have you all with us. So thank you for joining us. Um, shall we crack on with the show? Let's do yeah, it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So question one, this is for you, Danny. Have a listen. Motion is restricting free movement. Well, the... Uh... The government's immigration policy has reached the legislation stage. It's gone through the commons. They are going to introduce the point system. They are planning to increase the surcharge to migrants for using the NHS. But originally they were going to put that on the people who actually worked in the NHS and care system at the moment. They said that. I thought, well, I bet you that policy doesn't last. They'll send a minister out to defend it. And then 10 minutes later, they'll decide they don't want it, which is exactly what has now happened. But... The point system, that will still go ahead. Wait, they've done, the government have done the right thing? <laughs> well, let's, let's not go mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel uneasy. How about this? They've abandoned doing the wrong thing. There yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment that Boris Johnson defended it by saying it was because of the money that it would bring to the NHS, I knew it was doomed because it wouldn't bring any money. After all, if you're just charging what is effectively a handful of people, a little bit more than £600 at a moment when Rishi Sunak is supporting the incomes of about 80% of the British workforce, it's not going to count for very much. So that's caused uh, quite a fuss uh, this week. And at the same time, the government wants everyone to come over and uh, pick 
fruit. So uh, essentially, if you don't have a PhD in a STEM subject, you can't come uh, and work in this country, but you can be on SAGE and advise the government on coronavirus, I think. But, uh, you have to do that over Zoom, though, because it won't last. I tell you, for a, uh, for a split second then, when you said what motion is restricted movement, I immediately thought of dance moves. <laughs> I was like, oh, m- maybe the robot? You don't really use the legs that much? <laughs> <laughs> it's the most nonsensical thing I've ever heard to charge people to use an NHS that can't function without them in it. Like, what they're going to do next, try and charge dogs to be in pedigree chum adverts. <laughs> yeah. Let's be honest, though, guys. Come on. What are we doing? We picking? We picking? Fruit picking. I'm all in. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Because people, I remember when Brexit was happening and people were saying, you'll never get British people to pick fruit. And it turns out that British people do want to pick fruit. And all we had to do was ensure that every other form of alternative employment was literally impossible. <laughs> yeah. That's all we had to do to get British people to agree to pick fruit. Anyone who thinks that, that fruit picking is unskilled work has clearly not seen me uh, pick fruit. You know, Prince Charles actually said that fruit doesn't grow by magic. And even that was actually news to me. I, I didn't realise that was the case. <laughs> I'm not so worried about the fruit picking. I think, like, it's a very romantic image, isn't it? It conjures up all the kind of World War II imagery and, you know, if you're able-bodied... Dig for victory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I kind of hope and I'm glad that people will go and do fruit picking. I just am worried that it's a slippery slope and it's going to be very soon that it's a less catchy or jaunty campaign where it's rather than pick for Britain, um, it's going to be like, please come and be one of the hundreds of thousands of nurses, carers, refuse collectors, retail workers that we are now short of for Britain. Way less catchy. I have a a question. Can you decide what you want to pick? Do you get a choice? Because I, can you can you pick what you want to pick? Exactly. Is that what you're asking? I don't, this is the thing. I don't want to do vegetables. I mean, the very idea of picking for Britain is that you're not eating them. Oh, I think okay. we have to make that okay. clear. I, don't, I, don't I think that I'm... negates the whole point of doing it. If you're if you're going to eat half the harvest, I was like strawberries and grapes. <laughs> you thought you were going around the farm like Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Talk about pick your pick and picking it, Darren. During the war, my grandmother was in Siberian exile. They, she was put to the fields. She had to collect the weeds from the fields. But the thing is, she'd never seen a weed. Uh, so she didn't know the difference between the weed and the crop. So what she actually did in the end was remove all of the crop. Uh, and everyone was, and, and then let the weeds grow. And when the weeds grew, uh, nobody in the Soviet system wanted to admit they'd let the weeds grow. So they simply bailed it up and sent it off to the market. And nobody said a thing because everyone realised if they were the one that pointed it out, they'd get arrested. <laughs> what, what do we think of the um, immigration bill? That's, I mean, it's passed its first stage in Parliament, obviously probably going to go through several amendments. And what do you think of the points-based system that Pretty Patel's proposed? I've got an enormous bee in my bonnet about it. The points-based system is really popular. One of the things that was fascinating during the EU referendum was this idea that people loved the sound of an Australian points-based system, despite all the polling revealing that no one knew what an Australian points-based system was. <laughs> What's an Australian point, people asked. But yeah, it just sounded like Australia was a kind of <laughs> scary country full of scorpions, and therefore they probably had quite a tough immigration system where they probably let, you know, <laughs> put a huntsman spider on you if you tried to illegally immigrate. <laughs> but the problem with it is, is that the idea of unskilled labour, I've got such a massive bee in my bonnet about this. What it normally means is types of labour where it's really hard to measure who's skilled, right? There's no easy tick box way of doing it. You walk into a nursing home, you can instantly tell whether people in it are any good at being carers or not. It's just how do you capture that in a number? Well, I worked in, in social care for many years and I, I tell you now, I'd like to see Pretty Patel try and change a full incontinence pad in an ass to toilet and then she'll see what a bloody unskilled <laughs> worker. I'd definitely like to see that job swap. That would be very amusing. But I'd also like to see some sort of game show where <laughs> MPs are asked to do quite basic tasks. You know what I mean? Like, I'd really quite like to see the cabinet <laughs> fruit picking, actually, just just for a yeah. day, just to have a, you know, have a crack at yeah. it. This is the news that the proposed immigration bill has passed its first Commons vote. The current free movement system is expected to be replaced with one modelled on the Australian system. So it will look the same, but be tanned and better at cricket. Two points to Danny. Jess, well, on the rules for school. So, yeah, 
<laughs> Lovely. <laughs> this is the news that teachers and councils are putting pressure on the government about schools because primary schools are due to reopen for years one and six from the start of June. And there are fears amongst teachers unions, etc. and many teachers that it's not going to be safe enough to go back. Apparently only 5% of teachers think that it's safe to go back to work. I've got a four-year-old and I can safely say that getting a kid that age to social distance is like trying to get a sausage to tell you the time. <laughs> Year one, they're feral. There's times where getting him into his pyjamas, I feel like I'm reenacting the Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> the younger the child is, essentially, if you don't have any health complications, that you're the least likely to have a terrible time if you're to get COVID. But it's a virus that's transmitted by proximity and kids that age are obsessed with proximity. If they're not being violent, they're being cuddly. That's, that's literally, that's, that's sort of all they do. It's so hard to bring in social distancing in that context. I've got a dear friend who runs a nursery down in Dorset and we've all been taking the mickey out of her saying, yeah, good luck throwing a nappy from two metres away and hoping it lands on a bum. Like, I don't know how <laughs> it's meant to work. But the other thing, and I, and I mean this seriously, I, I don't think that the ministers have taken into account, it's not just the non-compliance of children that age um, but also the arrogance I think there are children that age who, who know who know and understand what coronavirus is but they're not prepared to do anything about it uh, my son and I were on a walk during lockdown on our daily walk he kept touching everything that we passed, every filthy bollard and gate and car. And I was like, please, can you stop? And he understands about the virus. I was like, please stop touching everything. And he went, these ones are fine. They haven't got corona on. And I was like, well, you don't know that, do you? What if he does went, know? Well, this worst thing gets worse. I was like, you don't know that. And he went, I do know that. I can see it. And having now been in lockdown with him for, what, well over two months, if there is a lab that's willing to take him, especially for cash, I am interested in a sale. <laughs> I, I think the whole situation is its so bonkers. At some point, kids are going to have to go back to school. And it's unlikely mm. that there's going to be an entirely risk-free time for that to happen. Yeah. Well, there's also, there's an argument, isn't there, that it's quite a, a sort of middle-class point of view to say, well, of course the children can't go back to school. But then if you're living in a high-rise block without a garden with, you know, three kids, or whatever you know those kids might be better off going to school where they can at least have two meals a day that are catered 100%. for them or, and you know those sorts Absolutely. of things they said they might do non-uniform which is mm. amazing if it was me i would just dress my kid up in like a hazmat suit <laughs> every day it's like oh darren's daughter's dressed like a beekeeper What's <laughs> i love the idea that now hazmat manufacturers can have a back to school sale <laughs> <laughs> danny are your kids school age are they uh, no actually the older two aren't the the youngest one aren't so i've got a 17 year old um who, who didn't have to do his a levels because it was cancelled and my older one's at university oh. um so no they're, they're not um the older who are not, not at school age, the younger one is. But uh, I, I guess, um, you know, I heard that 5% of teachers do want to go back. And, mm. you know, the idea if you ask somebody, it might not be safe. And if you don't do it, we'll pay you 80% of your salary. I certainly hope those 5% aren't teaching economics. I mean, I wouldn't want to go, I wouldn't want to go back. I wouldn't want to go back either. But in the end, we, we're going to have to... Uh, go back and we'll never be sure because the problem with coronavirus we can't be certain but it probably isn't actually that uh, dangerous any more dangerous than school normally is which is quite dangerous I, I, I like this idea of achieving social distancing I used to achieve that at school myself simply by talking to people about politics <laughs> <laughs> this is the news that despite measures being put in place, some councils are refusing to open their schools on the 1st of June. The measures being adopted mean that children will no longer be able to take their artwork home with them. However, you can get the same effect by simply not using a bin and sticking all of your rubbish to the fridge <laughs> instead. Two points to Jess. Everyone, have a listen to this. Walking on the beaches, looking at the beaches. Who is banking on a great British summer? Everyone. <laughs> no, no we, one. We all are. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. We're all having a good time in our kitchens at the moment, but, you know, we want to go oh. out on the beaches. Don't we, guys? Hey? Speak for yourself, Darren <laughs> Harriet. <laughs> I live in Brighton. I ain't going anywhere near that beach. <laughs> So this is a story that the um, Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, has announced that he's hoping that the UK tourist industry will be open for business from July, that we'll be able to have UK 
holidays. I, I know Oliver quite well. I don't think he's ever been to a beach. That would be my uh, <laughs> assertion. Com- confident assertion. He's quite tasty, know, he's isn't one, he? He's one of my, he's one of my very favourite people, but I don't think he's a beachgoer. To be fair, I'm not a beachgoer either. I used to get taken when I was a kid and there's like the one place where you get sandwiches in with real sand. There's nowhere to read. And obviously there's nowhere to go for a swim either, except that sort of ridiculously big uh, wave pool. And the idea of having an extra bank holiday in October in order to encourage tourism to Britain, I think someone's having a joke. I think it sounds fun. And I also like how they're calling it the Great British Holiday <laughs> to try and romanticise it. Because if you put Great British in front of something, then it makes it sound as fun as a baking competition. <laughs> so next I reckon they're going to be calling it the Great British PPE shortages. <laughs> as somebody who spends quite a lot of time staying in guest houses and hotels across the UK because of my job. I do think that if you want to up the tourist industry in the UK, you're going to have to sort of up our game a little bit. I've stayed in English guest houses where even the Wi-Fi code looks like it's from the 70s. <laughs> Angela, Angela, <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but what about, what about drive to the beach, sleep in your car? Boom. <laughs> and that's a holiday, is it? <laughs> Boom. Listen, I've been in my flat alone for the past two months, sleeping in a car right now. Nice. I, it makes my heart break a little bit when you watch all these people having pretend holidays within their own home. I think the only thing they're getting a break from is their own mental health. Yeah, Everybody's <laughs> doing pretend camping, aren't they, without ever leaving their home? It's got to be better than actual camp. I mean, I was brought up in a camping family. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I don't think it's a holiday if you're in something more rubbish than your house. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my favourite headline in all of this was just, woman who drove to beach is shocked that others have done the same. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think she was just annoyed because she thought that she'd, like, figured it out and nobody else had fought to just drive to the nearest <laughs> beach. <laughs> no, it's just that saying, isn't it? Like, you're not in traffic, you are traffic. And I think that is yeah. the, the thing that everyone needs to remember during the coronavirus times. If you're doing it, you can't criticise everyone else for doing it too. <laughs> this is the news that the Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, thinks that holidays in the UK could be possible from July. He also said that the only bigger champion of British tourism than him was the Prime Minister, whose last known holiday was to Mustique, which I believe is in Lincolnshire. Two points to Helen. <laughs> that brings us to the end of round one, and the scores are Jess and Danny have four points, Helen and Darren have two. Before we start round two, we've been sent this by a pupil in Dorchester from her homework instruction sheet. It says, read the attached research on child slavery and maybe do some yourself. Thank you for sending that in. <laughs> Helen, whose track and trace plans are making people unhappy? See what I did there. Ooh, this is pun <laughs> getting, isn't it, this week? Oh. Um, this must be the government's uh, plan for a COVID-19 tracking app, which has always been slightly contentious because both Apple and Google have got kind of off-the-shelf ones which are decentralised, so the information pretty much stays on your phone. And we've decided to do something a little bit different through the very snazzy-sounding NHS X because if you put an X after anything, it automatically sounds cool and like, yeah, to web 2.0, X. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I wouldn't make any claims like that about this app, to be honest, um, given that only just under half the people in the Isle of Wight have downloaded it so far. Um, maybe they're having a great time with it. Who knows? It's run into some trouble. I mean, as someone who very briefly got involved in a few minor website redesigns, the idea of building a whole app to track pe- millions of people in like four weeks just makes me come, want to come out in a cold sweat. So... It's Mm. one of the greatest technological challenges that any government's faced for an incredibly long time and made more complicated by deciding to try and go it entirely alone. And I slightly suspect we might end up falling back on Apple and Google on the basis that they've got a teeny little bit more tech know-how than (laughs) the British government. The (laughs) The Google and Apple have said, haven't they, that they don't approve of the government having access to the phone data that's the reason that they've not been involved with the rollout so far but then i just think yeah, really google i mean you know before i do when i need a new hair dryer like you're not <laughs> that precious over data usually are you my view is that this app isn't actually supposed to work what the way that it uh, will operate is that it tests whether or not you can use a mobile phone and if you can't use a mobile phone you're not allowed to go out Uh, That's the idea. And that that will be a proxy for the government having a different social distancing policy. Boomer vision, basically. That's what they're kind of calling it. The best news that I've had all week, have you heard about the llamas? Well, I've heard that llamas aren't somehow involved, aren't they, in in a vaccine hope. So if you'd said to me, what is the way that we'll solve the coronavirus crisis and someone had said it's a llama in a secret undisclosed location in Belgium, I would have gone... 
Yeah, okay, that sounds about par for the course yeah. this year. Yeah, <laughs> there's a there's a llama called I think Walker, um, and basically it turns out that they make very very small antibodies, whereas humans only make very large antibodies. So you might be able to synthesize a much better vaccine from llamas. So we don't need contact tracers. We need llamas. Llamas. Yeah. There might be a statue to a llama. Wouldn't that be lovely? I think <laughs> Parliament Square needs a llama. That would be the final finishing touch. But my misunderstanding is, but where does the llama put the mobile yeah. phone? <laughs> <laughs> They're a much underserved animal. They're really a lot more tech savvy than you think. It was it was a bit confusing that article because they said llamas have antibodies which could help fight against the coronavirus. Also, they make you feel good next to them. And I was like, what? oh come on! You show me a person who doesn't smile when they see a llama. Ah, oh, you got me. You got me. There, yeah. The, the thing about this whole um, track and trace app is, so you get like a message, and the message lets you know whether you've been in contact with someone who's my thing is how long until people start using it as a dating app let's be honest <laughs> it's gonna start happening you'll get messages going you weren't in contact with coronavirus but you made a connection with me how about a date like it's, it will start with it give it days and it will start genuinely one of the worries about it is that if you use the nhs one which only gives you unique code from your phone once a day it will become very obvious who's having an affair which is genuinely something <laughs> that the scientists researching it were like this will affect take up of this app but just to let you know there are a lot of people out there who are going to be very not keen on this i fundamentally disagree Agree, uh, agree, sorry. I fundamentally agree. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite. I do, because I think as much as like some people might not want to get the app because of their, you know, where you stand philosophically and politically on, on mm-hmm. liberty. <laughs> um, but, but equally, there's also shame. You know, I don't want the government knowing how often I walk down to Nando's just to check it's definitely still closed and I'm still missing yeah. out. I don't want anyone to know that. Also, I how, think how often app- is that? Daily. Mm. <laughs> It changes your Facebook status to infectious, so that oh, people can, uh, yeah, so that people can tell, you know, what they're getting into. Oh well, maybe it's not going to work that well as a dating app. <laughs> Have you seen the um, story about the contact tracers, the twenty-one thousand people? And in my head, I think of them as being a bit like umpa lumpers. <laughs> they sort of <laughs> they've had to do all their training online. I don't know if you've seen this, and and one of the trainees apparently asked um, how they best approach somebody who has a relative who's died of coronavirus and they were told to look up on YouTube. Like showing somebody a cat playing a piano is the best way to deal with it. I'm not sure. (laughs) I think it's absolutely going to work if the majority of people get it and that's not going to happen either because... Have any of you tried explaining to your mum how to turn her Bluetooth on? She thinks (laughs) you're asking her to give a pirate a private dance. (laughs) (laughs) I just wonder if there'd be more uptake on the app if we sort of gamify it a bit. You know, like if you trace 10 contacts and you get a little gold coin and that can count towards your immigration points. (laughs) Uh, This is the news that the much anticipated contact tracing app due this month has been delayed until June. So for the time being, at least we'll have to continue to enjoy mobile phone induced panic attacks the traditional way, like dropping it in the toilet and realising you forgot to stockpile rice or realising you agree with something Piers Morgan has tweeted. Two points to Helen. Darren, have a listen to this. Darren, who's still loaded in lockdown? This is the Sunday Times have released their rich list. Eh? Yes, indeed. Guys, we've all been waiting for this. This is the perfect time to release this list, isn't it? Uh, During a global (laughs) pandemic, when a sizable chunk of the world is out of work. You've just got all these people bragging about how much money they've got. I'll be honest with you, though. um, I won't won't lie. I do enjoy the rich list. Like, Mm -hmm. I just think it never fails to show me who to hate. (laughs) However, though, I do think these lists at times do feel pointless because we all know who the richest person in the world is. We know this. Well, okay, depending on who you speak to, if you ask my nan, the richest person in the world is someone who has accepted God in their lives. But (laughs) if you ask me, I would say it's Jeff Bezos, isn't it? It's Jeff. We know this. Jeff Bezos is the richest person in the world. He's so rich, he divorced his wife last year and she got 40 billion in the divorce and is now (laughs) the fourth richest woman in the world. For the first time in years, I actually didn't hate the number one on the uh, UK's richest person list because it was inventor Sir James Dyson. Indeed it was. Yeah, wealthiest man of the UK in the same way that the Helix Bridge is in the UK, in that they are both in <laughs> Singapore. It's funny, I thought that thing with James Ducks sucked. Um, hey! but, uh, <laughs> oh, it's fantastic um, this week. There's got to be room in here somewhere to say he's leaving <laughs> them in the dust. 
Um, <laughs> uh, oh. but of course, I work on the Times, and um, people think you work on the Sunday Times. So every time their rich list comes out, people start lobbying you. And it's very funny because <laughs> some people are lobbying because they really, really want to be on the rich list. And mm. some people are lobbying you because they really, really do not want to be on the rich list because they don't want to uh, start everyone approaching them or getting the newspaper. And uh, so we get all sorts. It's nice to have like an inventor. Well, he gave an interview, didn't he, where he said that he managed to blow 500 million on an electric car. And I thought, come on, mate, we've all fallen asleep in the back of an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you see anyone else that was on the rich list? My, my favourite one, and the one I think is most deserved, is Anthony Joshua. Anthony right. Joshua doubled his earnings last year, and he is on the young rich list. And I think to myself, if there's a person who deserves all the money in the world, it's somebody who, for a living gets punched. Would you rather be punched or be married to Jeff Bezos? <laughs> oh! Be, be punched. Oh. <laughs> Categorically. Oh. This is the Sunday Times Rich List, which was published this week. Inventor James Dyson came top of the list in the UK's richest people. Uh, he's already a knight of the realm, of course, so to complete the set of Britain's greatest accolades, he's just got to get rear of the year. Two points to Darren. <laughs> Before we take a look at the final scores, I have some devastating news for the panel. The Unicode Consortium have recently announced that there is going to be a delay to the rollout of the new set of emojis oh, that were due we in enough? 2021. How are we feeling about this, guys? Heartbroken. I think it's funny. <laughs> are we feeling sad face, sad face? We need it. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, I do look at emojis a bit like the way I look at the Fast and the Furious films. I'm like, I think we've got enough. Like, yeah. <laughs> nailed it. They said they're um, not going to be coming out with the new emojis for an extra year because they've got enough on their plates, specifically an aubergine, a taco and a very cute pair of cherries. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really lovely lockdown emoji uh, thing happen to me where so my mum and I share recipes quite a lot. We're obviously we're very far away from each other and um, pictures of stuff we've made, food. And then um, quite often she was replying with the puke emoji. And I let it slide a few times. And then I said to her, like, mum, your sense of humour is really darkened during this pandemic. <laughs> And it turns out she thought it meant green with envy. <laughs> oh, so cute. I've got a similar problem with my mum, which is that she thinks when she wants to blow me a kiss, she instead sends me the lipstick kiss emoji. Oh, it's a bit sexy. And every time I'm like, ooh. You know that thing where David Cameron thought that LOL meant lots of love? And I, and I rather than a laugh out loud. And I knew that because when my dad died, he sent me a message saying, I'm really sorry to hear about your dad. Lol. <laughs> David Cameron. Yes. There's also like emoji like etiquette. I learned that if you if somebody say asks you something or says goodbye and you put a thumbs up, it's like offensive. You I've done it before and people have messaged me back and gone, Is everything okay? Why why are you giving me that? I'm like it's a thumbs up, it's a universal sign. I mean, yeah. it's a, it does depend what you've messaged, doesn't it? If you've just said to someone, I love you, and they reply with their thumbs up, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's where perhaps it's a touch heartless. Yeah. Yeah. That brings us to the end of our show. And our final scores are Danny and Jess have six points. And Helen and Darren also have six points. It's a draw. Um, thank you to our brilliant panel and to you, the listeners, for joining us. We'll leave you with a warning in this listing for the Great British Menu final, spotted by Eric Dano. Contains some sexual content, some violence, and some upsetting scenes. And with that, goodbye. Taking part in the news quiz with Daniel Finkelstein, Jessica Foster Q, Darren Harriet, and Helen Lewis. In the chair was Angela Barnes, and the news was read by me, Neil Sleet. The chair's script was written by Max Davis, Catherine Brinkworth, and Laura Major, with additional material from Simon Alcock and Michael Fabry. The producer was Susie Grant, and it was a BBC Studios production. Hello, I'm Greg Jenner. Usually I host the You're Dead to Me podcast and work on horrible histories, but while we're all cooped up indoors, I'm presenting a new podcast for the whole family. It's called Homeschool History, and every episode is a fun 15-minute guide to a fascinating historical subject. It's cheery, informative, and suitable for anyone who likes silly jokes and funny sound effects. And who doesn't? <coughs> We'll have episodes on the Restoration, the Space Race, Charles Dickens, Florence Nightingale, Stone Age Britain and plenty more. So that's Homeschool History with me, 